In this lesson, we will be covering Chapter 10, Sections 10.4 through 10.5. Keep in mind, we are going to be skipping Chapter 10.1 through 10.3. So in Chapter 8, we looked a lot at microevolution, these small changes in allele frequencies of a population over shorter time frames. Generally, these time frames are in generations of the organisms. In this chapter, we're going to be focusing more on macroevolution, which is the buildup of small changes over longer time frames. These longer time frames can be years or even hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years. Keep in mind, the Earth is very old, 4.6 billion years old. Living things have been around for 3.8 billion years. This means that there are very long time scales. For us to work with when talking about macroevolution. The process of macroevolution leads to brand new species. This is where we get our diversity of life. So macroevolution produces biodiversity. These are just the different types of living organisms that we see around the globe. Biodiversity is huge. There are 1.8 million species named and identified so far on earth. It's estimated there that there are as many as 10 million living organisms out there. The smallest unit of biodiversity is a species. A species is a group of organisms that have a specific set of characteristics. Generally, these organisms are also able to interbreed. There are many ways to define a species. We are going to look at three different mechanisms or species concepts that help us group organisms into a specific species. The first species concept is the morphological species concept. Morphology is the physical traits or the anatomy of an organism. So the morphological species concept uses morphology, these structures, to group organisms. Morphological species concept often compares bones, muscles, skin coverings like hair feathers or scales. We can compare teeth, bird beaks and bills, or any other physical trait. Basically, this concept states that if two organisms look alike, then they are the same species. This species concept has some problems. There are some organisms of the same species that look very different. A good example of that are dogs. Dogs come in many shapes and sizes, from a chihuahua to a Great Dane. However, these animals are all still the same species. We can also see drastic variations in some types of insects. These butterflies seen at the bottom have two color morphs. To the untrained eye, you might think that these are two separate species. However, they're the same species, they're able to interbreed, they have many similar structures, but their color patterns are different based on environmental conditions. Another species concept compares the DNA structure of organisms. This is a newer field and still has a lot of questions to be answered. For example, how different does the DNA have to be before we categorize these organisms as two separate species? DNA evidence is often used to help support morphological species concept and the next species concept, the biological species concept. The biological species concept focuses on reproduction of organisms. This concept states that if two organisms are the same species, they are able to reproduce and have viable, fertile offspring. Viability has to do with the offspring's ability to survive in its environment. Fertility has to do with the offspring's ability to reproduce when it reaches sexual maturity. There are two key features of the biological species concept. The first one is these populations have to be able to actually interbreed or possibly interbreed. And the second idea is that we're looking at natural populations, ones found out in nature on their own, not in places like zoos or laboratories. The biological species concept focuses on reproductive barriers. These are isolation mechanisms. Reproductive barriers prevent successful reproduction in organisms. There are two types of reproductive barriers that we can investigate. Prezygotic barriers, ones that occur before the formation of the zygote during fertilization, 
and post-zygotic bar barriers, which occur after the formation of the zygote. We are going to look at several types of both prezygotic and postzygotic barriers. The first prezygotic barrier we're going to look at is habitat isolation. So, are these organisms found in the same place? An interesting example are jaguars and leopards. These big cats both look fairly similar. They're spotted, they live in jungles, and have a very similar behavior. However, these animals are not found on the same continent, let alone in the same area. This means that natural populations of jaguars and leopards will never meet, and therefore these animals are two separate species because they will never reproduce together. Another example are true wild horses, which are found in one region of Mongolia, and zebras, which are found in Africa. These animals, again, are in different places, which means that they will never meet and their populations will never be able to reproduce. Another type of prezygotic barrier is temporal isolation. This has to do with the timing of reproduction. If we look at these two frogs, the leopard frog and the wood frog, we see that they look fairly similar. However, the wood frog and the leopard frog reproduced at different times during the year. The third type of prezygotic barrier is behavioral isolation. Do the behaviors of these organisms match? One interesting example is courtship displays that we see in birds. Birds are notorious for their dances. And if they do not have the correct dance, then they will not be able to reproduce with the female. One example are the blue-footed boobies found in the Galapagos Islands. These birds start their dance by showing off their bright blue feet. If the female is interested, she will stick around. The male will then start to posture, flipping his wings forward and pointing his head and tail at the sky. If the female likes what she sees, she'll start to dance as well, showing off her feet and then posturing back to the male. Many different seabirds have dances that they use as courtship. If this dance does not match exactly what the female is looking for, she will ignore you and you will not get to reproduce. There are many examples of behavioral isolation. Co uh, courtship is just one. We also see gift giving, fighting, and songs common in the animal kingdom. Mechanical isolation has to do with the reproductive parts. Do the parts match? If not, these animals will not be able to reproduce. Reptiles are notorious for having uniquely shaped reproductive equipment. In this case, if the reptiles don't have the same shaped reproductive equipment, so male penis doesn't match the female vagina, those animals cannot reproduce. Another interesting example are in dragonflies. Dragonflies have claspers on the end of their tails. The males must clasp the female behind the neck to be able to form a loop of love for when they reproduce. If the male clasper does not match the shape of the female's head, he cannot grab hold of her, and they cannot make their little loop, so that reproduction will not occur. This is another example of mechanical isolation where parts must match for reproduction to occur. Another type of prezygotic barrier is gametic isolation. In this one, we have to look at the egg and sperm cells. Can they fuse in order to form the zygote? There are many different types of protein receptors and chemicals found on the cell membranes of both egg cells and sperm cells. If these receptors don't match, the sperm cell will be rejected and it will not be able to fuse with the egg cell, which means that reproduction will not occur. After fertilization occurs, there are three types of post-zygotic barriers that can still occur. One is zygote viability. So do the zygotes survive till birth, and can they survive in their environment afterwards? We can also look at hybrid sterility. So can these offspring reproduce themselves? A hybrid is often formed whenever we have two species mixing together. This hybrid offspring may be sterile or unable to make babies. A good example of this are mules. If you mate a horse and a donkey, you get a mule. Mules are generally sterile and unable to reproduce. The same is true of zebra-horse hybrids. These animals are viable, they can survive, but they are sterile and unable to reproduce.
We can also look at the F2 generation. So grandkids, can the second generation of hybrids survive and are they sterile? To be able to truly be one species, these animals or organisms have to continue to reproduce for many, many, many generations, not just one or two. So a good example of this is occasionally you find a mule who can breed, but their children cannot. So the second generation or the grandchildren of the horse and donkey are sterile. An interesting example of this hybrid situation is when lions and tigers are bred together. So we can look at several types of reproductive barriers that can occur between these two groups. The first one has to do with habitats of the lions and tigers. Generally in nature these animals are not bound together and therefore their populations will not breed or mix together. Okay. In zoos in zoos, we do sometimes see ligers being born whenever lions and tigers are housed in the same enclosure. However, these ligers are hybrids that are sterile. The biological species concept has some problems as well. This concept does not work well if organisms reproduce asexually or make clones of themselves. For this species concept to work, we have to have a reproductive event between two individuals, male and female. Is occur. This species concept also has problems when trying to apply it to fossils. It's very difficult to tell if two fossil skeletons have ever reproduced together. So, when looking at fossils and asexually reproducing organisms, Scientists have to rely on other species concepts, generally the morphological species concept, to help them group and classify organisms. So now we've defined a species and figured out how to separate them out based on different species concepts. The next step is actually categorizing these species. So we need an organizational system. Classification in general is the idea of grouping objects based on their similarities. Taxonomy is the science of grouping and naming living organisms. There's a whole branch of biology based on this. It's important that we classify organisms because it helps us figure out and represent relationships between organisms. It also helps make things easier to find and identify when we're studying them. Organization and classification can also help us understand evolutionary histories. There are about 1.8 million species that have already been named. There are about 10 million species actually out there. We may never know exactly how many there are because many are becoming extinct before they're counted and described. However, with this 1.8 million species, it's very important that we classify them or group them together so that we can better understand them and so that it's a more manageable pile of organisms to sort through. Our current classification system has eight levels. We start with domains, the largest categories, which include thousands of types of organisms. Domains can be broken down into kingdoms, which are smaller groupings still containing large groups of organisms. Kingdoms are broken down into phylum. Phyla are broken down into classes. Classes broken down into orders. Orders broken down into families. Families broken down into genuses and genuses are broken down into specific species. So you guys should come up with a mnemonic to help you remember the order of these eight levels. Here's an example. The Dutch kings play cards on flat green stools. This little saying uses the first letter of all of the taxa and comes up with a silly saying to help you remember the order. So domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So here's another view of this overall system. We have three domains of life, which are the largest categories. Each domain, such as domain, domain Eukarya, are broken down into different kingdoms. In this case, we're looking at kingdom plantae, because this is a plant. The plants are broken down into phyla, such as phyla anthophyta, and then the phyla are broken down into classes, like monocotyledons, and we can break those classes down into orders, orders into families, families into genus, and genus into species.
Here's another example classifying our own species. Humans are in the domain Eukarya because we have eukaryotic cells. We're in the kingdom Animalia because we are animals. The phylum Chordata because we have a spinal cord. Class Mammalia because humans have mammary glands. Order Primates, which are mammals that have two mammary glands. Family Hominidae, which means we are bipedal, walking on two legs. Humans are in the genus Homo and the species Homo sapiens. This classification system helps us group organisms that are similar. So, for example, the bobcat and the lion are in the same kingdom, the same phylum, the same class, the same order, and the same family. It's not until the genus that we start to see differentiation. So, bobcats are in the genus Lynx, the species Lynx is rufus, and lions are in the genus Panthera, and their species is Panthera leo. We can compare that to something like a mushroom, and we see that right away there is a different category or a different kingdom for this group of organisms. So classification is based on similarities of organisms. The more similar they are, the more of these categories will be the same for two different organisms. Another way of putting this is that our organization system is hierarchical. It has inclusive categories at the top, that lead to more and more exclusive categories or specific categories at the bottom. By the time we reach the species, we're talking about one specific type of organism. Let's practice for a minute. Which of the following is the most specific of our categories? The genus is the most specific. It is the smallest category towards the bottom of our classification system. Here's another practice question. Which of the following includes the most types of organisms? In this case, we want the largest. So the phylum is the closest to the top of our classification system and therefore is the most inclusive or has the most types of organisms. At the bottom of our classification system, we see scientific names such as Homo sapiens. Scientists use scientific names rather than common names, which are used by most people. So why don't we use common names in science? Okay, here's an example. What is the name of this cat? Well, technically all of these are correct. This cat is called a devil cat, a ghost cat, a mountain lion, a screaming cat, a puma, a Florida panther, a cougar. I could continue on with this for quite some time. This one type of cat has more than 50 common names. So why is it important to use scientific names? Because every animal, every organism has only one scientific name. In this case, this cat is called puma concolor. So common names can vary by region, sometimes even by day-to-day -day conversation. In Florida, that cat is often called a mountain lion, a cougar, a puma, or a Florida panther. It all depends on who you're talking to. So scientific names standardize the name and ensure that all scientists are talking about the same type of organism. Carl Linnaeus is known as the father of taxonomy. He was a Swedish botanist who attempted to describe the entire natural world. During his work, he gave every species that he encountered a two-part name. Our current scientific naming system is based on this two-part name, and we call it binomial nomenclature. Binomial nomenclature became extremely common, and again, it's still used today. Binomial nomenclature has some specific sets of rules. The first is that this two-part name is the genus and the specific epithet or species name. The genus name must always be capitalized with the first letter. The rest of the name, including the species name, will all be in lowercase letters. When you are typing scientific names, they should always be italicized. If you are handwriting them, they should be underlined. So, for example, I typed out Puma concolor and it is in italics. The genus name here is Puma 
and the specific epithet is concolor. Scientific names generally give us some information about the organism. For example, the name may relate to a characteristic of the organism or to the person who found it. So, again, with our example, puma concolor, concolor is Latin for of the same color. Puma is a type of cat. So, puma concolor means cat of the same color. If we look at the coat of these cougars, we see that they are all about the same color, this tawny brownish color. That is different than something like a tiger, which has stripes, or a jaguar, which has spots. Here's another example. If we look at the American black bear, Ursus americanus, this tells us that the bear lives in the Americas. Grizzly bears, called Ursus arctos, are closely related because they're in the same genus, but they live further north, towards the Arctic. In this lesson, we have investigated species concepts, which are ways to define and identify species. We've also looked at the classification system, a good way to group and gr organize our different types of species. In the next lessons, we will be learning more about macroevolution and the diversity of life.